Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this morning's short seminar on some tips to make your message more memorable, more sticky. There's nothing worse than being a presenter, being a trainer, trying to deliver some change management idea, and after your seminar, nobody remembers what your core message is. These tips come from a particular, some of the tips come from a book that I like. It's called Why uh, Made to Stick by Chip and Dan Heath. Uh, some, why do some messages stick and some messages fade away? And I've used some of the tips and some of my own ideas around making sticky and memorable messages. Made to Stick, Chip, Chip and Dan Heath. So as we get started, just a bit of housekeeping, ask questions as we go. Please uh, type, in the, type in the comment box or the Q&A box. I've got the comment, the chat box open. So please uh, ask questions. Take notes by all means. As with most webinars, I am recording this. So a video version will be available to you should you need to re uh, review anything that I've said. Participate. I love to have your comments, your ideas, your questions. Ask me anything you need to around this particular area that we're speaking on. And most importantly, think and apply. Think and apply the information to your own personal situation. Is there anything you can do to craft a more memorable message moving forward? Do you have a previous presentation you've done where maybe it didn't have the impact, the memorability, the stickiness of the message that you hoped? And what, would have, what could have you done as a result of today's webinar? The idea is walk away with maybe one or two things that you think that you can use tomorrow to have more impact with your messages in a public speaking sense. So these are the tips and we'll go through these one by one in more, ex in more extent. Uh, what's in it for me? One big message, have a call to action. Use the element of surprise or an unexpected message. Make it concrete. This mostly applies to numbers and statistics or obscure ideas. Make it concrete. Make sure you bring in your credibility and don't forget the power of storytelling. So what's in it for me? Most audiences that you will speak to, whether they're at work, whether they're at a community forum, most audiences come to you for a reason and they have an issue that they want to solve or they have some goals that they want to achieve. And this is called the pain to pleasure continuum. Now, most of you will, will, will know that in a general sense, alleviating pain is a bigger motivator than creating pleasure. So what is your audience's pain point? What's keeping them awake at night? And when you craft your message to solve someone's problems, you don't have to push, you don't have to shove your message, your idea down their throat. And all it is is the marketing moves from what we call push marketing. You need to do this. I recommend you do this to pull marketing where the audience says, can I have some of this? I need this. This is going to help me. Now, a way to, I guess, think of pain is what's keeping your audience awake at night. Uh, what Panadol, what headache are you the Panadol for, the paracetamol for? How are you going to give them hope, light at the end of the tunnel, a belief that they can do this, they can achieve this? Or how are you going to help them meet their goals? 
their key performance indicators, uh, reach their targets if, it's, if that's what their goal is. And the way to think about this is, well, this is what's keeping them awake at night. This is what are they dreaming about during the daytime. A couple of examples. Within the mining sector, one of the things that happen is occupational health and safety. Should you work in a mine, in a mine site, you will be inducted. You'll have a one-day health and safety training before you can set foot on the mine. And this is how a training officer will start their presentation. And I'm going to ask you um, what's in it for you after I've summarise what the opening will be. So thank you for coming today. Uh, we're going to go through a one-day occupational health and training course. Before I go on, I just want to ensure you that my sole purpose for today is to ensure that you go home safe and sound in one piece to your family, to your loved ones, to those who depend upon you. That's all today is about. Now, I need to talk about steel cap boots, safety hats, policies, procedures, reporting, incident tracking, a whole range of mundane and boring type policy issues. And I understand that, but please realise the reason we do this is to ensure that you get to go home each night, every day, to your family, to your loved ones. What's in it for you? Why should you listen to my message? Thanks. Thanks, Sarah. Yes, you get to go home. So you don't die. Yeah. So sometimes you have a strong message and all it is is flipping it so that rather than you saying, I need you to do this, I need you to be compliant, I need you to follow the rules, that's pushing, push marketing, flip it in to say, what I want you to do is I want you to achieve this so that people pull it, they buy it off you and it goes to pull marketing. Um, a second example, I've been in business for 10 years. The first four years I ran my business using a software called Myob. I have to do my best statement every quarter and my ob is uh, manage your own business. And it was really hard work. It was a manual system. I used to every weekend lock myself away for two days and manually enter the data from my, my shoebox of receipts, from my bank statements, from my check butts. And it took a long time. And then one day a young man at a small business forum I was attending said, Peter, we've got this in the cloud software called Xero, X-E-R-O, that'll take your bookkeeping from two days to two hours. From two days to two hours. Does he have to sell me that? No, he doesn't. The pain that I had around my bookkeeping for my BAS statement every quarter, which I did for four years, so that's 16 weekends locked away, uh, was like pulling teeth without, without anaesthesia. So what this did for me was it just transformed my business. It was a weight off my shoulders. Zero is really, really expensive, but it doesn't hurt because the pain that he took away was so strong um, that zero is the best thing since sliced bread in my view. So this is how can you create your message, craft your message, flip your message, invert your message so people realise that this is going to solve a big problem for them or alternatively help them achieve a, a goal, an aspiration that they've been struggling to. What's your one big message, that one idea that permeates all the way through? If I say to you Nike, Nike shoes, Nike's one big idea is just do it. 
I did a public speaking workshop on Friday online and my one big idea that went all the way through was that public speaking is a skill that anyone can learn. Regardless of nerves, regardless of fear, regardless of anxiety, public speaking is a skill. Barack Obama on his first ever election night said to the American people, 200 million people on television, he spoke for 45 minutes and in that 45 minutes he only said one thing and that one thing was, yes, we can. Yes, we can come through this global financial crisis. Yes, we can deal with the healthcare system that means that some of you cannot walk into a hospital and get that life-saving treatment that you deserve. And so, yes, we can was his theme that went all the way through. Another way of looking at this, I suppose, would be to have repetition of that one big idea. Now, you have to be careful with your repetition. Don't make it too cheesy. I saw a video of Scott Morrison talking about the Mid-Northwest and living the life on the Mid-Northwest. And up here on the Mid-Northwest, uh, these people have a microbrewery and they're living the dream on the Mid-Northwest. And it was about 20 Mid-Northwest in a three-minute television interview. Now, to be fair, that's a sticky message. I know where he was. I know where he was. He was in the mid-northwest of New South Wales. And it, it, uh, the mid-north mid coast, uh, my apologies, the mid-north coast, uh, it was just too much, so much so that he lost me and I've shown that video to other people. So what's your one big message that's going to permeate all the way through without being a cheesy call to action that reiterates what that one big message is? This is your tip number two for making a memorable, a sticky message. Number three is a call to action. Ask your audience to do something. So with the occupational health and safety in the mining sector, they have a pre-start every day and their call to action is look after your mates, be safe. If you see anything, report it. And within the mining sector, anyone has permission to call out a safety concern, something they're unsure of. Anyone can do that. It doesn't need to be reported to a supervisor who then reports to the manager and then the manager says, uh, I don't think this is safe. We need to stop work. We need to shut down. We need to get this checked. Anyone can do that at any level. And that's that call to action. One of the mistakes that people do is they speak and then they stop talking. Thank you very much. You've been a lovely crowd. Thanks very much. Have a great day. You know, that's just that soft landing. You can have a call to action throughout your presentation and reiterate your call to action at the end. Ask your audience to do something. If you only do one thing from this webinar, pick one hook, one memorable strategy to make your next presentation more impactful, more influential. Pick one strategy if you only do one thing. What is your call to action? An unexpected message helps your message be memorable. I've got the fortune a cookie there and oh my gosh something that is unexpected a surprise 
something that we just wouldn't. And depending who the audience is, that can be something that's going to surprise them. Uh, on my workshop last week, my public speaking one day workshop, I spoke about domestic and family violence and every five days in Australia, a woman loses her life to someone who supposedly loves her, to a partner or a previous partner, an ex-partner, every five days. So it's about 65 women lost their life in 2019. So it's more than one a week. Now, if you speak to a group of domestic violence uh, workers, they know that, so there's no surprise. Perhaps if you speak to a group of uh, men that you're trying to influence, that may shock them. The other statistic that I used was for here in West Australia, every day, every moment, so as you're sitting in your in your home offices, your offices at work, there's 15,000 West Australians experiencing elder abuse. So that means right now, there's 15,000 of our grandparents, our parents, our uncles, our aunties, that are being abused in one way or another. And that abuse could be with the food, the cuisine that they would like to eat, that they would normally be brought up on. And that means their clothes haven't been changed, so they're sitting in dirty clothes. And there is that recent South Australian case, which was more disability than elder, but who was neglected to such an extent um, yeah, this makes your message more memorable. So if I take it to Victoria with triple the population, uh, I'm assuming there'll be about 40,000 Victorians at any one moment experiencing elder abuse. This, by the way, comes from Advocare WA, the peak body that advocates on behalf of retirees and elderly in Western Australia. So another way to look at this is to set what people think as the normal paradigm, take them on a bit of a journey, and along that journey, shatter the paradigm and build the new paradigm so that they remember. Now I'm going to give you one quick example and I just need to uh, apologise in advance if I, um, if in any way I offend anyone on this webinar and uh, certainly anyone who identifies as an Aboriginal First Australian or an Indigenous person, um, my purpose is not to offend you. My purpose is to highlight a very real problem that Australia has. So, I'm going to start by setting a new, uh, I guess, uh, appealing to your guessing machine, and then I'm going to take you to the new paradigm. So I want all of you to cast your mind back to your first 18 years of life. Uh, for most of us, the first 18 years of life, and if not you, I apologise, the first 18 years of life was fairly carefree. We were young, we were healthy, we didn't have many worries for most Australians. I grew up on a farm in Denmark. Um, I used to swim at the local beach. I played football, I played cricket. My dad paid for all my football boots, uh, all my cricket pads. I went to school... Um, it was just a really ideal life in the southwest of Western Australia. Uh, by the age of 17, I had my first car. I got my driver's licence early and I was driving a Toyota Corolla. By the time I was 18, I had my first girlfriend and my first kiss. These are real trouble-free, enjoyable memories for me. 
I'm now going to take them away from you. They are removed from your very existence. Those 18 years are expunged from your life. The life expectancy of Aboriginal Australian men is 18 years less than white Australian men. That is a gap of 18 years, which is one of Australia's shames, one of Australia's uh, most, one of those things we just have no excuses for. So good morning, everyone. My name is Peter Dew, and I want to talk to you about bridging the gap between Aboriginal health and the rest of Australia's health. So that's what I, that's the model. That's a model for giving people surprise. And I could have just said, so I'm here today to talk about the difference of 18 years between Australian men's life expectancy and Aboriginal Australia's men's life expectancy. And what can we do as a group to address that? I could just announce that. We're trying to make messages a little bit more memorable. So this is a technique. Maybe that one's not the most eloquent one. Uh, how could you use this as you move forward? Thank you, Jan. So much more powerful. The other one is I go the other way forward. You're now all 65. Enjoy your retirement life. What are you doing? Are you traveling around the world? Well, not at the moment with COVID-19. Are you driving around Australia with your caravan and your four-wheel drive? Are you helping your children get into their first house, their business, or maybe your grandchildren? What are you doing at age 65? Enjoy this retirement lifestyle. You have earned it. You deserve this. Uh, can I have everyone's attention, please? 90% of Australians, 9 out of 10 of you on this webinar, will never achieve your retirement lifestyle, your retirement dream. 9 out of 10 Australians fail to achieve the dream. Good afternoon. I'm a financial planner and I want to help you address that issue to make sure you do achieve your retirement dreams. Surprise. Concrete message. This is data, statistics. If you give numbers and you want people to remember them, it can be really quite hard. Classic example that I use, the human heart pumps 350 million litres of blood. Uh, according to the Heart Foundation of Australia, the healthy human heart on an average lifespan will pump 350 million litres of blood. I'm hoping you will all remember that. Also, the Heart Foundation tells us that they've handed out 36,729 kilometres of rope to school-aged children with the Jump Rope, Jump for Heart program over the last 10 years. I'm hoping you've got those two numbers. I'm hoping you will remember them. All right, let's go back to the human heart. I want to make this data a little bit more concrete. So the human heart, 350 million litres of blood. I want you to go home tonight, turn on your kitchen tap, full bore, so wind the stop cock out all the way of your kitchen tap and leave that running for 45 years. That's how much the average human heart will pump during your lifespan. Turn on your kitchen tap full bore, leave it running for 45 years. Another way of saying that, and let's move to the mining sector, the resource, oil and gas, that is enough to fill three of the world's biggest super tankers. Your little pump the size of a tennis ball will three, fill three of the world's biggest super tankers. Let's go back to the skip rope. It's enough to switch to stretch from Sydney to Hawaii and back four times. 
water saving devices, they save X amount of litres of water. How many Olympic swimming pools is that? If you need people to remember your data, your statistics, please make it a little bit more concrete. Credibility. So you want an influential, memorable message. Why should I trust you? What gives you the credibility to tell me how to suck eggs? Or why should I follow you? Why should I believe you? Credibility leads to trust. With trust, people are more prepared to follow you, to believe you. Quick story, you may have heard that there was a young West Australian scientist in the early 80s who discovered what caused peptic ulcers, stomach ulcers. He found a bacteria, Helicobacter pylori. So went around the world saying, hey guys, I can cure peptic ulcers. I know what causes it and I have a treatment and antibiotic that will kill this bacteria, Helicobacter pylori. Nobody believed him. At the time, peptic ulcers killed hundreds of thousands of people around the world. No one believed him. They said, where does he come from? Does he come from King's College in London? No. Does he come from Harvard Medis Medical School? No. Where does he come from? Fremantle in Western Australia? Uh, no one's ever heard of that. Everybody knows peptic ulcers is caused from stress, too much alcohol, poor diet. Also, the gut is full of hydrochloric acid, so no bacteria would survive in that environment of the gut. No one believed him. For eight years, he travelled the world. I know what causes peptic ulcers. I can cure them. I just need some research. I need some money. I need some funding. I need to be able to cure the world of peptic ulcers. Nobody believed him. So after eight years, he went back to his laboratory in Fremantle, and overnight, he incubated in an incubator one billion Helicobacter pylori. Some of you may know this story. He then drank the entire contents. Three days later, he developed severe peptic ulcers. He got a colleague, a medical colleague at Fremantle Hospital to do an endoscopy. And he took the biopsies and the photographs that showed peptic ulcers. He then treated himself with the antibiotic. Another three days later, peptic ulcers were resolved. He did further endoscopy, showed the scar tissue, the resolution, further biopsies, the resolution of the peptic ulcers, and he went back to the world and said, see, this is what causes peptic ulcers. I'm talking about Professor Barry Marshall. He is the Nobel, Australia's Nobel Prize winner for medicine. It does not matter how right you are, if you don't have credibility, people will not buy from you. Where does your credibility come from? Good news is, your credibility, it's not just one thing. Are you writing? Are you contributing on LinkedIn? Do you create content? Do you curate content? I've written a book. Uh, use your qualifications use your experience sometimes you can borrow credibility if you're thinking of an innovative way of doing something uh, uh, something around social housing community housing maybe the canadians have done something very interesting you can borrow that credibility so don't feel that you have to hang your credibility hat on one thing it's called your credibility stack And the last tip, share your story. Share your story. People remember stories more than they rem remember data and facts. Your story is your unique intellectual property and you don't need to learn or read your stories. That's two really big advantages. You don't need to learn your story. You've lived it. It's your life. It's your case study as the client you worked with. And no one can tell you it's not true or it won't work. It's your unique intellectual property. This is why stories help you become more memorable. If you talk to people, give them facts, data, one in 10 people will recall what you've said. The retention rate is 
That is a very poor return on investment, running a seminar, running a workshop, and in a week's time, one person in 10 remembers. If you add visual, so PowerPoint, some handouts, I showed you the book earlier on, maybe I do some flip charts, I'm tripling the retention rate to 30%. Seven out of 10 are still not going to remember. If I tell you a story that engages you, that creates a visceral and emotional response, then I'm increasing my retention rate to 70 to 75%. That is why you tell stories. I run a whole webinar just on the art and science of telling stories. So there's seven tips to help your message become more memorable. What's in it for me? What is your one big message that permeates all through what you're saying? What you're saying? What is your call to action? If you only do one thing today, take one of these hooks, one of these ideas, one of these strategies to make your next presentation more memorable. Use surprise. If you're using statistics or data that you want people to remember, make them more concrete. Turn your kitchen tap on for 45 years. That's how much the human heart pumps. Where does your credibility come from? You want me to follow you. You want me to change my behavior as a result of what you're saying. What gives you the credibility to ask me to do that? And use your storytelling. What's coming up? We've got face-to-face -face workshops in Perth. We're open for business in Perth, but I'm doing a lot of online stuff still, thinking and speaking off the cuff, impromptu speaking, 9th of July. Winning presentation skills uh, online works really well, 22nd of July. Giving and receiving feedback. So many people avoid feedback. Communication etiquette in an open plan office and how to handle difficult customers. Um, these are all on our website. You know how to reach me. I can provide you. So Sarah, you've just jumped on late. This is recorded. I will provide you with the recording. You know how to reach me, but here's my call to action. How are you going to make your next message more influential? How are you going to make it stick so you're not just hot air? You're not doing a scattergun approach where you spray and pray and you say lots of stuff and you hope people get your core message. These are science-based techniques that authors, speakers use to make your message stick.